What's up, everybody? And I would say a normal welcome to the podcast, but I actually recorded it yesterday, and some things went wrong with the way the lighting was and some other things. So I'm a day late getting this out, but uh, that's no big deal since this thing is just getting started, and it's not like I've got tons and tons of subscribers to to answer to. So back in the garage yesterday, I had all the audio equipment out, but there were some problems with the lighting. Um, and I don't know if you can hear it in the background, but it is pouring here in South Florida. So pouring rain, that is. So we'll just get to it. I'm going to talk a little fast today because I don't have a lot of time. But obviously, Buffalo shit the bed in, in London against Jacksonville. I actually wanted to make a video after that game, but... Uh, some things kind of got in my way from doing that. The reason I want to make a video is I knew what the media narrative would be about Josh Allen losing the game for Buffalo. Because idiots like Nick Wright, who don't know anything about sports, think that one person wins or loses a game in football, and that's just not the case. It's called a team game, but in reality, it's more of an organizational game. Because your whole organization has to be in lockstep and has to be relied upon to make the whole machine work and be able to put a good 53-man roster together, keep them moderately healthy or as many people healthy as they can through the year. Um, There's so much more that goes into it besides that. You've got ownership, you have boards of directors, you have the GM, the assistant GM, all the finance people, you have athletic trainers, you have chiropractors, you have PT people, you have Uh, massage therapists and massage people you have nutritionists there's a whole lot that goes into the machine of a football team that that can kind of dictate the outcome whether they're going to win or lose jerry jones is notorious for having the best strength and conditioning teams come in and help their teams and the best outside the box thinkers or people that can come in and assist with with getting the team healthy and, and on the field and putting out a good product The reason I say that is because of this. In 1999, the ownership of the Bills forced their coaching staff to start Rob Johnson instead of Doug Flutie in the wildcard game against the Titans, even though Doug Flutie was the guy who got them there. And what ended up happening was a forward lateral known as the Music City Miracle. The point of that is, is sometimes... The higher-ups in in organizations screw the games up for players. If I was the owner of the Buffalo Bills or I was one of their higher-ups or executives and the NFL came to me and said, we want you, a premier team in the league, because that's how it's advertised. Buffalo's advertised as a premier team in the league. We want you to go play the Jacksonville Jaguars in London, but they're already going to be out there because they're going to have a game there the week before. My answer would have been not only no, But fuck no. Because you're not going to ask a premier team in the league, a team that you're relying on and making a lot of money off of, you're not going to ask us to travel across the Atlantic Ocean to play a team that's already been there for two weeks and has had time to get used to the time change and the weather and the atmosphere and the field that you play on. You can save that for the Chicago Bears or the Carolina Panthers, or one of these other teams that are vying for a top five draft pick. But you're not going to do that to us. If the NFL came back and said you have no choice, my answer would be, okay, as soon as the game is done Sunday, go home, relax. Monday morning, we're flying to London. Because we need to be out there for as many days as we can to get used to everything that goes on out there. If you're the type of coach, and McDermott probably is, that doesn't care if your players go out partying, then... Jacksonville has probably already done that. And if the Bills are going to do that, you want them to get there and get it out of the way. But what does the idiot ownership of the Buffalo Bills do? They have them leave Thursday night and arrive in London Friday morning for a Sunday morning game, which is the stupidest thing that they could have done. You could tell watching the game that everything seemed to be like a step off. Everybody was just a beat off. There was drop passes, which comes from being a little sloppy or groggy or jet lagged. There was more penalties than usual, which is from sloppy play, from not being on point 
and partially comes from jet lag, and it just accumulated. You could see the Bills put it together towards the end of the game, which was about 12.30 Eastern Standard Time. And football is not the only sport affected by it. Everybody is. The Adesanya-Strickland fight, they ended up fighting at 1 or 2 in the afternoon on Sunday because the UFC wanted the whole card to start at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I think that was one of the reasons that Izzy seemed to beat off because it's weird if you're used to fighting Saturday night and now you're fighting Sunday afternoon. So even if it's a time change and you're just not used to doing it at that time, as an athlete, it throws you off. And the Buffalo Bills decided to listen to what somebody, I don't know who, but somebody in the organization said, all you have to do is sleep on the flight over and you won't be jet lagged. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. That's a fucking idiot giving you bad advice. First off, you can't tell grown men to sleep. You could be up for two days and if I say, hey, you need to go to sleep right now, you're not going to fall asleep for two hours because you're forced to. And still, there's no way to get around jet lag. You just have to go and you have to wait your time. And some people, it takes a little longer than others. But being in London for a day and a half and then having to play a football game against a team that's already been there for two weeks puts your team at a tremendous disadvantage. So all the people who were excited about Buffalo beating Miami, because now we're playing smart and we're doing this, you can thank the organization for crushing your dreams on Sunday. Because Buffalo looked like crap because their idiot organization decided the smartest thing to do would be to fly across the Atlantic Ocean, five time zones, and give them a day and a half to get ready for a game. It's straight garbage, once again, from the Buffalo Bills. If Josh Allen was at fault, I'd be the first person to say, this is Josh Allen's fault. That's not his fault. He underthrew Diggs on two wide open passes that would have been touchdowns. He underthrew him very badly. That's not because he played bad. It's because he was probably jet lagged. His body felt like it was probably 10 or 11 in the morning. He's like, what are you doing? You're trying to go perform at a high level and you're still, your body's still waking up. So shame on the Bills. And shame on the Bills fans for thinking that, oh, Now we have it figured out. Buffalo will always disappoint you. I understand now, because we've had a talented team for a few years, why the Dallas Cowboys fans are the way they are. Dallas Cowboys fans are insufferably annoying. But they're that way because their team is always talented and loaded. They're a talented, loaded team. They just are poorly coached and do dumb things that cost them games. And Buffalo is the same way. The fucking ownership group should have known better than to fly out there and give your team barely any time to to, um, get acclimated to anything going on in that country. And then they went out and they put garbage on the field. So fuck the Buffalo Bills ownership and shame on any fans that fell for it again. You can't fall for this shit over and over. Buffalo will leave you eternally disappointed. That said, let's move on to what else happened this weekend. Um, It was beautiful watching Dallas lose to the 49ers. The Dallas Cowboys are a really good team at beating teams under 500 that have bad quarterbacks. And once again, Dallas Cowboys start the season against the Giants, which it seems like they do every other year. A Giants team that is never prepared, has no talent, and is not going anywhere. And Cowboys fans think that they've won the Super Bowl. So Dallas is getting what they deserve because they're not that good of a team. They're talented, but there's a difference between talented and good. And Buffalo and Dallas are prime examples of that. It was great watching that happen. I will say this, though. They're playing the Chargers and and then the Rams after a bye. I think they'll beat both teams. I don't trust the Chargers. The Chargers my entire life have always been a team that, like, when you need them to win, they lose. And when you need them to lose, they win. And I think the Chargers lose. And I don't think the Rams play the Cowboys competitively. The Rams are a team that the Cowboys can have success early against and then kind of ride that success till the end of the game. I hope I'm wrong. That's just how I see it going. Tennessee, way to go. You went up against the Colts' backup quarterback and backup running back, and you fucking lost. Because once again, Mike Vrabel should not be the coach of that team. Mike Vrabel is a good head coach in the wrong spot. He should be finding a team that has a really good quarterback and a good offense that needs defensive help. 
and he'll win a title. He can't help Tennessee. He can't do it. And it's one thing if your offense is inept, but your defense is out there holding teams to 17 points or under like they did last year. But this year, the defense is struggling. And when the defense is not holding up their end of the bargain, and you already have an inconsistent or inept offense, you're going to get a 7-10 and 10 season. And that's what's going to happen to them. And that's unfortunate because my son's a Titans fan. The Titans should have fired Vrabel after last year when they pretty much got rid of everybody else. They didn't because he's a good coach. Sometimes you're really good at your job. You're just in the wrong spot. And that's what I think Vrabel uh, is in right now. As far as the rest of the games go, it was a great weekend as far as parity in the league. If you look at the way the standings are, got a lot of divisions where it's like 4-1, and 3-2, and 2-3, and 1-4. and one and, four. and teams that look good one week, not looking great the other, and vice versa. It makes it much more interesting. About week 10, I think that you'll see some teams start to pull ahead. Um, one of the things that happened to the Bills again is now Jones and Matt Milano are out for the season as well. I've heard some complaints about the the surface that they played on in London. I've heard that even the the soccer team that plays there plays on natural grass, but they were playing on a weird turf, which is basically a sheet over concrete. So you're running on concrete with cleats on, and no wonder why injuries happen. Once again, Buffalo should have told the NFL, we're not going to put our players on this garbage-ass field. Get us a better field. But the NFL doesn't care about players. They only care about money. And the Buffalo Bills are too dumb to know what's good for their players and what's not. So you got what you deserved. You better not fuck it up against the Giants. The UFC this weekend was actually pretty good. Uh, Joe Pfeiffer fought uh, Abdul Razak Hassan. I think Abdul Razak Hassan went out there and stood in front of him and just stared at him. Which I don't understand why he did that. Pfeiffer said in the pre-fight interviews, he goes, all this guy can do is strike. I can strike, I can wrestle, I can grapple. That means he's going to try to take you down, which he did 10 seconds into the fight. Hassan threw some calf kicks, and Pfeiffer wasn't ready for him, and you could see that it was taking its toll on Pfeiffer. If Hassan had fought smarter, he could have landed three or four more, and and Pfeiffer would have been up the creek without a paddle. Pfeiffer hit him with a takedown, was able to come away with a victory. It's going to be interesting seeing him against top 10 guys because he's a big, strong, powerful guy. He's got a lot of potential. Him and Bo Nickel is going to be wild to see. He almost reminds me of Brian Stan, to be honest. He reminds me a lot of Brian Stan, but a little more polished. Um, in the main event, Grant Dawson fought Bobby Green. Bobby Green is the worst type of guy to fight if you're an up-and-comer trying to get pushed. Because Bobby Green is a really good fighter with a bad record. Guys who are really good fighters with bad records are guys that just don't give a shit. Like, there are people who can't stand the thought of losing. Like, they hate losing more than they like winning. And then you have guys like Bobby Green, Kevin Holland's another one, that, like, they just want to go out there and fuck shit up. If they win or they lose, they don't care. Or maybe they care minimally, but it doesn't have the same effect as it would on somebody else. Now, Bobby Green is a good fighter with a bad record, and he's awkward to deal with. Dawson was just kind of trying to find his groove, got caught, because Bobby does this thing where he's not all the way righty, or he's not all the way lefty, but he'll kind of stand a little square and then he'll lead in which, with which way he's going to go. So even if he's like slightly, this would be like, so if I'm standing here, it's weird in the camera because it's reversed, but this is me staying orthodox. But this is my left shoulder. It's slightly ahead of my right. Even if this looks like an orthodox stance, it's still kind of square because usually you're going to be more like this. And Bobby does these things where he's here and then... He's going to lead with this hand, but as he leads with it, it's like it turns into um, a weird angle. He's not here throwing a jab straight at you because it's not really a jab. It's almost like he's here and he kind of shifts his shoulder. So now it's behind and then he throws again. And it's almost like a straight punch coming at you from where a jab should have come from. But because he's square, it's hard to read which way it's going, where it's going to be. And he caught him. Bobby Green is a good fighter. He has an awkward style. He has his hands down a lot. He has his shoulders square. It, it, it throws you off. It's weird to look at. It takes a little bit to get used to. And Dawson just got caught at the wrong time. Dawson's going to be a stud. He's not going to fall off the cliff at all. 
Um, he's got a lot of good talent, and he's with the best gym in the world. So congratulations to Bobby Green, Grant Dawson. Keep your head up. Another good thing about my podcast getting fucked up yesterday and me having to quickly record this today is overnight we found out that Volkanovski is, is going to fill in for Oliveira in two weeks and fight Makachev. I think Volkanovski is going to take this fight. I like Makachev, and I hate the fact that him and Volk are fighting because I'm such a fan of both guys, more Volk than than Islam, but I still like both guys, and it sucks as, as a fight fan to see two guys that you like fight. I hated the fact that they fought the first time. I think there's less unknown from Volkanovski's point of view about Makachev. He knows exactly how strong he is. He knows exactly how he can wrestle, and Volkanovski's striking is so crisp. People don't People don't think of Volkanovski as a stand-up fighter. You don't think of him as a wrestler. You don't think of him as a grappler. And the reason that you don't think that about Volkanovski is because he's so good everywhere, nothing stands out. He's not an average fighter who is, um, what do they say, uh, jack of all trades, master of none. Volkanovski is a master of all trades. He's got awesome wrestling. He's got good wrestling defense. His jiu-jitsu is good. His jiu-jitsu defense is good. He, he, he's an excellent striker with excellent defense. He's got big power. He has volume and he never gets tired. It's really hard to deal with that guy. Like, really hard. And he's probably unbelievably strong. So, people don't think of Volkanovski as a stand-up fighter. Because it's not like... A guy like Adesanya, where striking is so much superior to his every other game. Volkanovski, everything is superior to pretty much everybody in the division. And as much as I'm a fan of Ilya Teporia, I think Teporia, his time isn't yet. I think he would have lost to Volk the first time. And like Cejudo Johnson, in the rematch, he would have got him when it was kind of time for Volk to move on. I don't like making predictions on fights where I like both guys or fights that I haven't had a long time to analyze it. But I'm going to go on a limb here and say Volkanovski takes this. Because I think Volk knows enough about Islam to maybe be 5% more aggressive or aggressive in different places where he wasn't as much. And that 5% will give him the decision rather than Islam. Which sucks because I think Islam has some interesting matchups at 55. And I'd like to see Volk go back to 45 and stay there as a champion. I think Volk... There are some people at 55 where the the size will make a difference or the power will make a difference. I think Gaethje gives Volk problems. Um, but Volkanovski is a little bit better of a grappler than he is. So that'll be, that, that would be an interesting matchup. I think that Michael Chandler and Volkanovski is interesting as well. Chandler's shorter, so him and Volk would look like two tanks in there. Super crazy news about that. Um, we do have a card coming up this weekend. I, th- I forget how you say his name, but it's like Sadiq Youssef against Edson Barboza. Um, I don't really put much stock into either into, into that fight. You know, Edson's in the later part of his career. Youssef, it's been a while since we've seen him, so hopefully it's a good fight. We, we get some good matchups uh, coming out of it. Um, as for everything else, you can't take life too seriously. My son's stepfather is a Bills fan who's older than me, and he's yet to learn his lesson about not believing in Buffalo because he was disappointed. He really thought they were going to kick the Jaguars' ass, and you just can't do that. You can't you can't fly to London on two days' notice and beat a team that's been there for two weeks. It's not going to happen. If you're superior to them talent-wise, they're still going to make a fight because at that level, the difference between great and good, it's it's not that much. It's 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 a lot of little things, maybe. Like, the, if you take a look at a guy, and Dan Orlovsky. Dan Orlovsky, I respect him a lot as an NFL analyst. Uh, he His playing career probably didn't uh, get to the level that he was hoping it would. But as an analyst, he's top-notch. And one of the things he was talking about was, he's played in London twice, and it didn't matter when they flew over because the other team's... Dan was never on a team that has the talent that Buffalo does. Buffalo can beat 75% of the NFL teams on talent alone because their talent is so good. But if they're off a little bit because of jet lag, because of a bad week of practice, because they fly to Miami and go fucking partying on a business trip and they're hungover during the game and they need IVs after the first quarter, even though my son plays football every Saturday in the same fucking heat, that these grown men go and play 
My son plays offense and defense. These guys play either, either, not both, but either, and they need IVs after the first quarter. And my son can go out there and play the whole game and barely drink any water. And it's the same Florida sun. It's noon on Saturday or 1 o'clock on Sunday. It's a shit like that that gets Buffalo their asses kicked because they can't beat everybody on talent alone. They're, they're talented, and they can beat a lot of teams. But when it comes to stupid little things like that, you still need to stay top-notch. And that's why Buffalo will always disappoint you. And that's why I spent years and years and years being angry at the Buffalo Bills. But now I just have a podcast to express to other Bills fans, this is why this team will always let you down. So until next time, which won't be that long because it's already Wednesday, stay frosty, motherfuckers, and get some.